Kia ora. Welcome to Cobblestone's Chronicles. It's uh, lovely to be here with you again and to be um, in our new studio setup. It's very exciting. It's much easier to use. Really simple stuff. Even I can probably get this right. Um, this morning, I, I just want to say my thoughts are with people in Auckland. What a terrible time they've had. It's just been... Um, devastating and I have a very good friend who lives in West Auckland who said you know it's really been bad up there they haven't been able to go places and I also had several friends who were at the Auckland Folk Festival which was supposed to be at Cumnew um, Showgrounds and the festival um, was well they managed to put on a few of the acts they had a, a little bit of music but most people um, either had to go home because it was so wet or, I mean, they sat and they couldn't camp because it was so wet. So I feel very sorry for the organisers. I know they put heart and soul into it and they're all volunteers. So in recognition of that this morning, I'd like to play a song called Waitamata, which is um, a, a hymn to Auckland. It was written by my husband who... Um, Grew, used, lived in Auckland from the age of about 12 through until he was 50-something. Uh, and um, it really loves the place. And so this is Waitamata or Sparkling Waters. Here we go. The sun is setting of the harbour the laying sheet of gold on the sea the lone bird cries above the still water tracing circles in my memory Today's the day that I could walk on water Life in the mirror of the sea Today I'd say that I could walk on water This is the place I'd rather be Out to the east Islands wait forever Rangitoto Sleeps on the way The dark volcano Heaves out a shoulder This is the place I'll spend my day And you lay sleeping in the car While I measure distances from shore to shore And you lay sleeping in the car While I measure distances from shore to Here on the beach, 
I'd swear that my life is A note in a bottle And drifting away Today's the day that I could walk on water Laugh in the mirror of the sea Today I'd say I could walk on water This is the place I'd rather be Waita Mata by Niels Gedge and the Harmonies by Helen Dorothy. Lovely song celebrating Auckland and thinking about all those poor people and hoping that everyone that we know up there is okay. I mean, of course, Great Han and the surrounding area has had its own share of floods. And I was talking to my neighbour um, a couple of nights ago and he was telling us about when the Waihanga River, well, sorry, the Waihini River, um, overflowed well and truly and came right up to where we live now. It didn't, doesn't, it's never been as high up as our house, but um, seemingly it flooded the front paddock. And um, Mike's mum, who th they were living there as a family, asked him to go and rescue her chickens which and her chicken coop, which were in the front paddock. And poor Mike, who was then about uh, 12 or 13, he uh, went down to rescue the chickens and got swept right up against the barbed wire fence and bears the scars to this day. So it, floods are really scary things when they get going. And um, I was reminded when I was uh, sitting in the car park at Carterton on Monday lunchtime, when we got a nice belting of rain, that in Suva, where we lived for a while in Fiji, um, we used to get real tropical rain, and the ditches are at least a metre deep there be to, to deal with that kind of rainfall. I'm just wondering when we're going to need ditches like that. It's... um. It's a bit of a scary thought. Um, this morning I thought I'd read uh, some more from Gareth Winter's excellent book, Streetwise, How the Streets of Carterton, Greytown, Featherstone and Martinborough got their names. And um, some of the streets are really interesting names. So in Martinborough, for example, the the main road from the west leading to the southern coast was known originally as Otaraya Road from the point it came up towards cutting on the western outskirts of town until after it passed through Waihenga at the southern end. It was decided to rename the street with two different names. The western portion from the rise to Martin Square was designated Kitchener Street and the southern portion Jellico Street. So why Jellico, you think? Well, Jellico was a commander-in-chief of the Grand Fleet during World War I, a position he had achieved after a distinguished naval career. Having born, been born in 1859, he was the son of a naval captain and entered the Navy as a cadet in 1872. And those of you who have read Patrick O'Brien's books or the Hornblower books, you, you'll know that that was, how they en that was how the Navy worked. You entered as a cadet in, on a kind of like apprenticed to a ship's captain who, in return for taking you on, agreed to train you and bring you up. It wasn't quite the same as the, the army where you could buy a commission. 
Um, rising through the ranks, he was made captain in 1897, so that's almost 20 years. He commanded the Naval Brigade during the Boxer War, during which time he'd been severely wounded. His fame was at its height during World War I when his actions in drawing the German fleet out for a decisive battle off the coast of Jutland led to Britain gaining command of the sea for the duration of the war. Jellicoe was appointed Governor General of New Zealand in 1920 and became a popular figure throughout the country. He returned to Britain in 1924 and in 1925 was created an Nero, and he died in 1935. So Kitchener Street was named in honour of Horatio Herbert Kitchener, the first L. Kitchener of Khartoum and of Broome, who had been born in 1850. Kitchener received his commission in 1871 and was second in command of the Egyptian cavalry by 1882. He served with distinction during the Egyptian campaign and was appointed Governor General of Sudan in 1899 before serving as Lord Roberts Chief of Staff in South Africa. He was Commander-in-Chief of India from 1902 to 1909 and he was appointed Field Marshal. He was Secretary of State for War in 1914 and he set about equipping the army for what he thought was to be an extended war. He increased the army from 20 to 70 divisions and of course the famous picture the recruiting po poster where Kitchener is standing looking very stern with his magnificent moustaches and his his hand out the front and his finger crooked bringing um, you know making signs of come towards me saying your country needs you that's Kitchener he died in 1915 when the M HMS Hampshire, on which he was travelling to Russia, sank off the Orkney Isles. And it's interesting how, um, you know, these two people that it was named after had been around not only in the First World War, but um, Kitchener was also around in the Boer War. And I was talking to my husband the other day, who's currently doing quite a lot of research into family history. And he uh, was telling me that in fact both of his grandfathers had enlisted to fight in the Boer War. One of them had actually gone to South Africa. I believe the other one didn't actually make it to South Africa. They had um, only been in the army here in New Zealand. But um, it's, you know, that's only two generations ago. It's amazing when you think about it. Um, and it's not, it's not that long ago, really. So, um, you know, because Niels can remember at least, you know, his one of his grandfathers. So, there we go. So on that um, note, I think that, um, I'll play another song now. Um, I'm going to play a song called The Hills of Coromandel, which was written by Dave Jordan in 1860, celebrating the Coromandel, which of course actually had a bit of a gold rush. And the poor Coromandel, they, um, they've been cut off, they've been an island for a few days because the roads have been blocked. So I think our sympathies with them too. And I think you'll enjoy this one, The Hills of Coromandel. Ah, hold on now because I've got a bit of a disco error happening. I'm just going to try this one again and um, dial up the song again, which is The Hills of Coromandel. Here we go. grow ancient green and tall as they have always done there and spread together over all to 
shield the earth from somewhere Seedlings spread, young trees grow old Old ones fall and turn to mold Till bush returns to hills once bare Man it seems was never there and The apple trees still bloom each year in the hills It was the gold that brought the men And thousands here did rally Their secret chatter shafts remain Abandoned in the valley In roads they fashioned in clay Were overgrown and washed away And fences built my settlers' hands have gone rejoining broken lands, and a rusted gateway only stands in the hills of Coromandel. No more the pubs where once they stood, the shanties. Timber church is gone for good With ruined, rotten steeples It's years now since the mine came To work the gold exhaust his claim Then leave this place for a better gain What he found looks just the same and The toppled tombstones bear their name of Carmando Days of gold are past and gone with the men who took their chances The bush is slowly marching on In a silence no one answers Birds call out to who empty Dear, there's no one comes, there's nothing there But a gate that's open to nowhere Names on sandstone faint but clear and The apple trees that bloom each year in the hills The Hills of Coromandel, written by Dave Jordan in 1960 and sung there by Chris Priestley, um, who was also playing guitar on that. He's a very, um, he's a, he's a very accomplished guitarist, Chris, and um, he of course used to own and run Cafe One Two One on Ponsonby Road in Auckland, for those of you who know Auckland. And he was always very encouraging for other singer-songwriters. Always used to play a lot of live music, and or have a lot of live music there. And um, a very enjoyable place to go, it was too. So, hoping that it's survived and that they'll continue to play live music. I know Chris was out at Kumu at the Folk Festival over last weekend, and I hope he didn't get too damp. I gather they had to do everything unplugged because everything was so wet that they didn't dare plug in any, any sound systems. So, um, going back to streets of around Martinborough, um, the McLeod family of southern Wairarapa is a numerous family originated in Caithness, Scotland, where many of them were shepherds. The youngest of the family, Alexander, had a different calling altogether. 
His father, who was a bootmaker in his spare time, taught Alexander the trade for which he quickly became well known. Following the death of his parents, he had shifted to Bristol where he worked in the wholesale trade. And then having made some capital, he moved to Melbourne in 1886. Then two years later, shifted to Martinborough to join his kin. He established a general store in his new town, but was soon making books, boots in a small factory behind the store. His brother-in-law was brought in to manage the store and eventually brought out MacLeod's interest while Alexander moved his boot-making factory along Oratoria Road. There on the corner of the track, commonly known as MacLeod's Lane, he built a new factory called the Radium Boot Factory. As a sideline, he also produced boot polish to his own recipe. His son Matthew ran that business and shifted it to the Hutt Valley in 1911. So the little lane eventually became Radium Street after the Radium Boot Factory. And of course, in those days, in the early 1900s, it was so important to have really good boots because you were out on the land all the time working away. There's also Malcolm Street, Daniel Street and Esther Street. Malcolm and Daniel Streets were formed in 1906 when Malcolm McLennan subdivided his land on the corner of Oratoria Road, which was then Jellicoe Street, and Dublin Street. The land had been part of John Martin's land holdings, and of course John Martin was the person who set up Martinborough although it was not part of his original Martinborough plan. McLennan's father, also a Malcolm and a shepherd on Te Awa Iti Station, bought the land in 1880. He had previously bought land in J.D. Baird's subdivision of Wahinga. He died in 1883 and is buried in the Wahinga Cemetery. The property is well known in the Martinborough area for the number of blue gum trees planted on the land and part of it became a homestead for the McLeod family called the Gums. The nearby Esther Street formed just following the McLennan subdivision in 1907 was named after Esther Sutherland, nee McLeod, who owned the block. Esther MacLeod had come to New Zealand in the 1860s to join other members of her family, so there was quite a crowd of MacLeods in the Martinborough area. She had married her cousin, William Sutherland, with whom she had a daughter, Elizabeth. And following William's death in 1883, Esther moved into Martinborough with Elizabeth, though she retained an interest on in the farm. Elizabeth then married Donald Cameron from Paiha and the family returned to their portion of Naipu called Moraki. The exact origin of the name of Daniel Street is a little unclear. Local Martinborough resident Ted Finlay, in Memories of South Wairarapa, thought it commemorated Daniel Cameron, but this seems unlikely because the man he knew as Dan Cameron was in fact Donald and Malcolm McLennan, not Esther Sutherland, named the street. Another Daniel living in the area, Daniel Haggerty, farmed just south of the streets, so it was possible the street was named after him, though it seems to be more likely in honour of another McLennan family member. D if you live in Martinborough, you might have noticed Hawkins Drive. So in the early 1900s, Martinborough-born transport operators Trevor and Carol Hawkins subdivided some of their property in Regent Street, giving their family name to the street they named. So that's how come Hawkins Drive is called Hawkins Drive. It's amazing how streets get their names and... Um, sometimes how they got them is lost in the in the dreams of history behind us so 
I notice that um, some sometimes our streets are um, are named and then renamed, and we were talking about um, you know how streets get named the other day because we have a couple of new streets in Great Anne near where I live in Great Anne, and um, I must find out well who they're named after because I noticed one is called James Kidd Place, and I, he might he might have been somebody who's very well known or a, a mayor or something. I shall find out and let you know. Meantime, how about we have another tune? So I've got to tell you that the tune that I'm going to play is called Waikata Iti. And I was talking about the um, Waikata Iti and the East Cape this morning because we've had some lovely um, visitors, some German visitors staying in our homestay and I've been chatting to them about where they might go to see the best of New Zealand and it's very difficult sometimes to try and figure out what people would like but um, I've always loved the area um, around the East Cape and the um, Tura, uh, where the Tuhoi live and this is about a little lake called Waikaraiti, written by Niels Gage, performed by Amanda O'Connor and Marion Carter, as well as Niels Gage. So here we go, Waikaraiti. <laughs> I've been driving on a gravel road Past the hills and through the bends To this lonesome lake I love Where the forest never ends No, it never ends And my heart went out on a journey My heart took a track of its song Track of its song And I walk up to the waiting lane Once I took you there Hear the fat Carrero fly Crash landing somewhere And I recall You laughed so suddenly my heart just sank like a stone, sank like a stone. The echoes of your laughter, the echoes of your laughter, they're still here. The echoes of your laughter, the echoes of your laughter, I can hear them everywhere. Time has etched and shaped the silent place Now it waits, so calm and still Life has left its mark on my face Time is gentle, time is cruel And the seasons move so slowly Seasons have no end have no end I've been driving on a gravel road Past the hills Through the bend To the lonesome lake I love Where the forest never ends My heart went out on a journey. journey My heart took a track of its own A track of its own Why carry 
Waikar Iti by Niels Gedge and backing vocals Marion Carter and Amanda O'Connor and the Kalanga was by Amanda O'Connor as well. Just a, a beautiful song about a beautiful place. And of course, um, I think everywhere in north of Taupo and in the east coast of New Zealand has had a bit of a battering over the last week. I don't know... Um, I hope uh, it's going to be not so bad towards the end of the week because I gather there's another uh, rain event going to happen. So, um, I have been reading this book called Touring Edwardian New Zealand by Paul Moon. I've got a lot of time for Paul Moon. He's a fantastic historian and makes um, the history of New Zealand very accessible. Uh, you don't have to be a, a scholar or a geek to enjoy his writing. And, um, of course, the Edwardian tourists in New Zealand were having a very different experience from the early settlers because New Zealand was, of course, still being settled, which was part of the attraction for the Edwardians coming to New Zealand. And um, um, this, uh, in chapter 11, he talks about Wellington and how the tourist, having transversed various locations south of Topo, uh, the tourist was now en route to the country's capital, Wellington. And for many, this city, with a provincial population of approximately 50,000, represented something of a return to civilization after they had spent days or even weeks making their way through the wilderness of the center of the North Island. Um, of course, these days we have a choice of two highways <laughs> to get ourselves through the, the North Island. We have State Highway 1, and if that one's not working, we have State Highway 2. And... Um, and and then, you know, cutting across at Napier uh, to Topo. So Wellington was possibly the newest capital city in the empire at this time. So we're talking about the early uh, 1900s. With its designation having been made just 37 years before the publication of the Tourism Handbook by Thomas Cook. But despite its recent elevation to capital status, Wellington had been a settler town for 60 years by this time and had the same trappings as any other city in the colony with its full complement of hotels, men's clubs and churches covering all the main denominations. And importantly for the Thomas Cook travellers who had been to a series of remote locations after leaving Auckland, the firm Thomas Cook, had an office in the Government Life Insurance Building next to the post office in the centre of the city. The Tourism Handbook contained an outline of Wellington designed to give a general impression to the prospective tourists of what to expect when they arrived. Wellington, the capital or empire city of New Zealand, it began, is situated at the head of Port Nicholson which, of course, we know as the mouth of the Te Iki Amaui. A fine harbour, secular in form, one of the safest and most commodious in New Zealand, and it was precisely because of its central position and accessibility that for some overseas travellers, well, Wellington was the first port of call in the country. It was depicted in the Tourism Handbook as simultaneously new yet established. And um, in the book, at the page I'm reading from, is a superb photograph of the Opera House in Wellington. And for those of you who have been to the Opera House, you'll know that it has a somewhat precipitous 
stairs that lead down in the in the gods and um, I remember a few years ago going to see uh, Billy Bragg I think it was at the Opera House and it was the first time um, I got the tickets at the last minute and it was the first time that I'd actually walked down those stairs and I have to say that um, I have avoided the gods in the opera house ever since because the the dress circle is I think much more to my taste um, because you feel as if you're almost going to tumble down and land on somebody some poor unfortunate person in the stalls and they might break my fall but I might break their back I think um, the capital had lots to offer because there was a colonial museum when it was renamed the Dominion Museum in 1907, which was immediately opposite the entrance to Government House and which contained a unique exhibit in the form of a complete Maori house with elaborate carvings and New Zealand curios in general well represented. So it was an exciting place to come. I suspect that not too many people um, on tourism and tourists ventured into the Wairarapa, um, which you know is not really well known as as a, a, a tourist area, and probably um, the Lord of the Rings being made in parts of it here has actually um, got the Wairarapa in the tourism books. So, um, I'm actually going to play you another song now, and I thought I'd play a whaling song or a sealing song, because of course the early settlers were very keen sealers, because the sealers were, um, sealskin was in high demand, um, particularly in the mid to late 18th, uh, 19th century, because sealskin Hats were all the vogue. The top hats were very often made of a sealskin. So I'm going to pay, play you uh, Davy Lauston, which is um, a song about the sealers. Here we go, Davy Lauston by Chris Priestley. <laughs> Hided seal, oh hided seal. My name is Davy Lauston, and I did seal. Though my men and I were lost, though our very lives it cost, we did seal, we did seal, we did seal. We were set down in open bay We're set down, oh we're set down We were set down in open bay We're set down We were left, we gallant men Never more to sail again For to sail, for to sail to sail. Now Captain John Bedar, he set sail, he set sail. Yes, for old Port Jackson, he set sail. I'll return man without fail, but he foundered in a gale. Down and went down, went down.
killed ten thousand sins for the fur, oh for the fur. We cured ten thousand skins for the fur. Brackish water, putrid seal. We did all of us fall ill for to die, for to die. So come all you lads who sail upon the sea, or sail the sea. Come all you jacks who sail upon the sea. Though the schooner governor Bly took on those who didn't die, never seal, never seal. Seal. Never seal, never seal, never seal. So there's an interesting story about this song. It's a bit of a sad song and I suspect it reflects a lot of the things that went on in the um, 1800s when the sealers were here in New Zealand and they were, um, it was a hard life, it was a hard, dirty life. Um, seals can be quite dangerous and, um, and then there was always the, you know, the the thing would the captain who had dropped them off to get all the seal skins would he come back and sometimes they didn't and the story I heard about this song is that it was lost and it was found again and a bit like the Wellerman song which has become very popular sea shanty recently um, I'm sure you've heard it soon may the Wellerman come um, it was, it's a very old song. It's a very old New Zealand song. So there you go, from early settler times. So just um, a few words about uh, things that are going on at Cobblestones at the moment. So we had the a fantastic music on the green on the, um, at the end of January, on the 26th of January. Um, the weather was incredibly kind to us. We had a beautiful day, sunshine, um, no rain. <laughs> I think most of us had been praying to the weather gods for weeks beforehand. And we had a fantastic uh, group called the Zimmermans who came and played. We also had a fantastic young group from the Wairarapa, from Wairarapa College. They're all in their final year at Wairarapa College. And they um, they came and they opened the show, and they were fabulous. They brought the house down. They were just so good, so professional, so competent, just great young people. It was lovely to be able to have them there and to support some Wairarapa young people. So, talking about um, music, we have another concert on the green at Cobblestones on the 12th of March. Uh, it's going to be a favourite of, um, of the Wara Rapper. The, um, it's a chap called Andrew London, who and he's coming with his trio to play. Um, he's very entertaining, very well known, and a New Zealand singer-songwriter who writes about New Zealand things, which is lovely. And he gently takes the mickey out of us in New Zealand. And he's, he does it very gently and very nicely. Um, I, I really enjoy Andrew myself. And he's also been known to break out into some really good dancing music. So 
put that date in your diary. There'll be lots more information coming out about it soon. But um, it's a really good use of our lovely gardens. And just in case you didn't know, if you want to, you can come to Cobblestones and visit. Um, we have picnic tables in the garden, so you're very welcome to bring a picnic in and enjoy your lunch or whatever in the gardens. And um, it's just a nice place to sit and enjoy and the kids are of course amused because they can run around and look at all the curious things and come back and say did you know that they have washing machines and they weren't using electricity and do you know that they've done this and do you know they had 10 children in that tiny cottage so it does keep the kids amused for a while that's for sure so do come and visit us soon and um Watch out for special high days and holidays as well. Um, I think I might play another song now. I'm going to play a beautiful song um, by a group called You, Me, Everybody. And this is a song called Tears That You Cry. I know that um, Nat Talkington, who is part of You, Me, Everybody, has had a very sad event happened in his family recently so I just want to play this in memory of and just for Nat Like the 
tears that you cry Soon they'll be gone like the tears that you cry Many words spoken remain untrue All of the hours go by just the same Take all the meaning, take all the shame Nights get longer and days they go by It gets better Doubt in your mind Soon they'll be gone Like the tears that you cry Soon they'll be gone Like the tears that you cry Tears That You Cry Written by um, Lawrence Fangos Rhodes um, Who's a, an excellent young musician from just outside Hamilton and um, who's also a luthier who builds beautiful guitars, lovely guitars. So um, that's about it for this week. I've, my name is Jeanette Wallace-Gedge. I bring you Cobblestones Chronicles every week. Um, I, it's record, this is coming to you live this week from the studios of Arrow FM and I've got to say the new studio is making my life very easy I don't have to concentrate too much on all the knobs and bells and whistles because it's all straightforward these days it's all automatic so this is lovely and thank you for being with me I look forward to being with you again very soon bye <laughs>